My father here died in a soft bed in a silent house in the middle of the night. He wasn't ailing. My mother heard him sigh, thought he was having a dream, didn't realize until the morning that he'd gone. She dialed out the shocked news to my family, but my sister Catherine received the news somewhat differently in her home in Montreal. She woke up at around the same time that my father had died with a very distinct sense of a presence in her bedroom. And that followed, uh, was followed by a sense of hands cupping the back of her head very tenderly. And then that, uh, the next thing that happened was a sense of um, an infusion in her of profound joy, a kind of quiet joy, a sort of sense of serenity and security. Now, of course, when we found out as a sort of larger, secular, rational, northeastern family what had happened to my sister on this particular night, it instantly transformed the narrative of what was a really brutal uh, shock of losing my father. All of a sudden, it took on a kind of mythic resonance, in fact, and it became the story of how my father somehow went to my sister and reassured her and then went ahead of her and was there for her when she died, as she did two months later. Now, I'm a journalist, and so I was immediately extremely preoccupied with the question of what the hell just happened? And I have spent the last four years researching this question. I don't have time in a 10-minute talk to actually give you the answer, uh, but I can touch on a couple of issues. One is prevalence. So we now know from research that's done both in the United States and in Europe and in Australia that the uh, sensed presence experience is actually approximately 40% of the bereaved population that has it. Uh, there are uh, two subsets within that population. One, of course, is the uh, marvelous synchronicity of having this experience before you know the person has died. I'm sure there's somebody in this audience tonight who's had this experience or knows somebody who has. It's somehow the intake of a knowledge that is then confirmed by ordinary means. The other subset is the tendency of a really quite a small, perhaps about a 5% um, amount of this population having uh, auditory and visual hallucinations around the, the uh, deceased. So it could be that they hear them speak to them, reassure them, or they see them at the end of their bed. It's never a frightening experience. It's very often profoundly, quite radically, uh, transformatively a reassuring experience. These are called grief hallucinations. And our understanding of grief hallucinations is basically a presumptive understanding. We don't actually know very much about the neuroscience of hallucinations. There's some research that's been done on mapping the neural correlates with the schizophrenic population in auditory hallucination. But nothing, of course, has been done with the bereaved population. So when we call these grief hallucinations, we're just assigning that uh, a label because it's a safe label to assign. Now, there are two other uh, scenarios in human experience where the sensed presence pops up. Um, one is in situations of sort of uh, adventuresome peril. So people who are climbing Mount Everest or on polar expeditions or who are um, voyaging at sea, solo adventurers at sea, will have this experience of suddenly becoming vividly aware of a um, supportive companion who stays with them until their sense of peril has dissipated. This has also shown up in uh, theaters of war. It's shown up in situations of, of rape. And it's also shown up in uh, various terrains. So original sort of neuroscientific theory about this was, well, it has to do with oxygen deprivation at high altitude, or it has to do with sensory deprivation in monotonous environments. But in fact, the terrains in which these experiences happen turn out to be very rich and various. So it remains a bit of a mystery. And the other scenario in which this happens, of course, is at, at the moment of death, the deathbed vision. This is from a movie called, uh, I forget what it's called. It's a, a Thai film, Uncle Boomby, something or other featuring monkey ghost and sex with a trout. Uh, <laughs> 
it won the Khan Award a couple of years ago because it was so odd. Um, but what I like about this still from the movie is that here's Uncle Boombi and he's dying of a renal failure and the woman with him is actually his deceased wife who's come to, uh, in a very intimate and practical and embracing way, take him with her to wherever they're going to go next. And uh, that is, in fact, the kind of experience that people who have deathbed visions have. They're not like, uh, you know, fractious hallucinations. The deceased wife does not suddenly turn into a swirling Mitt Romney's head and then rectangles and stuff like that. It's a very narratively coherent experience. And uh, one physician, palliative physician, has called it morphine for the soul. So, in our culture, this is all rubbish and poppycock, and so we've come up with our own way to understand the sensed presence in our long, long lost loved ones. They've become salt shaker shaped bits of drapery, <laughs> or they're really scary, and they like chase us through alleys. And it's very difficult to explain to my son and daughter that my sister is not a rattly skeleton now chasing me away from her. So, so these are incredibly impoverished understandings. And it is not the case in all cultures that we have such an impoverished understanding. Here we have an instance of uh, Japanese ancestor worship. What I like about what the Japanese basically have done is they've taken this very common subjective human experience and given it a very straightforward interpretation and uh, developed rituals around it to continue to honor the people that they believe they are having continuing contact with. And in fact, they have done a study of Japanese widows. You can read that or I can read it with you. Uh, but what they found was that most of 20 Japanese widows interviewed during the acute grief phase of mourning adhered to the cultural beliefs and were less depressed and anxious and had less difficulty accepting the loss than those who did not. So again, you know, the research is beginning to burble up, particularly within the grief literature, that these experiences, if you um, allow them to have the meaning that they seem to have to people, can be extremely efficacious and healing. And of course, as you all know, the other place where you might see a sort of slightly Catholic version of that is in the uh, Dios de las Mortes. So what I want to leave you with simply is this plea that until you have proved to me that we are robots, and not merely by assertion, but by actual proof, I'd like to hang on to the sacred and the intimate moments that I've had in my life and that so many people have. Thank you.